but we're also seeing a lot of what I like to call third culture cooking. And that's taking the food from you know, your parents, your grandparents, whatever heritage, and incorporating that with the culture that you grew up in in, right. in Toronto. And Hi, I'm Stacey Lee Kong, and this is Making Our Own Way, a Friday Things video series about GTA creatives who are finding their own pathways to success. Today, I'm chatting with Chiron Louis, a Toronto Star food writer. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'm going to jump right into questions. When did food become interesting to you for itself? Um, when I couldn't find any other journalism job after graduating. <laughs> the realest of real talk. That's basically it. In high school, I thought I was going to go into arts because my uh, dad worked in print advertising and had all these um, books and magazines on graphic design. And it, I would always look through them when I was a kid. So I thought, okay, I would like graphic design is, is my passion for lack of a better yes. <laughs> phrase. Um, but then um, in high school, you know, I took the art classes and the photography classes, and I was good, but you know, there were people that were admittedly way better than I am. So I thought, okay, if this was high school, then like there's going to be a million of these more talented people right. in university and in the job field. So I was like, all right, art's not an option for me, and I was not good at math. Um, I, science is not good either so I was like all right let's 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 do English um, so uh, you know we did those career aptitude tests yes. in high school yes I remember and something like reporter <laughs> somehow came as like my number one um, option so I was like all right let's that's let, it that's what we're doing let's let this you know prehistoric BuzzFeed quiz um, dictate what I will yes. do for the rest of my life yes so did the journalism for four years, um, and then I graduated just as a 2008 recession was kicking in and sent out dozens of resumes, didn't hear back from anything. Um, but then I got an internship at Toronto Life, which is a local city magazine. And the week that I started, they started a food and restaurant blog, and that's kind of how I got my start into food writing. Okay, so from there, from this opportunity where you get introduced to food, tell me about your career journey. Um, so I did the internship for, I think it was three or four months. Yeah. You know, it was, it was fun, it was interesting. I was learning about food, I was talking to chefs and just learning about how restaurants worked and, and why things are the, the way that they are. And I think the editors, my editors at that time, they were like, okay, you know, this is like, you're doing a, you're doing a good you're, job. You're doing a good job. You're pumping out content while we're paying you pennies. Fantastic. Um, and then I kind of stayed on afterwards as a freelancer. Back then, um, they had these little like hundred word restaurant reviews. So I kind of wrote like a few of those. And then uh, Alt Weekly called iWeekly yes. um, was around at that time. And they were in the process of rebranding into a different publication. So their editors reached out to me um, because I also interned there before. And they're like, hey, we're starting this um, new publication. We're going to cover restaurants and food in the city. And you seem to enjoy it at Toronto Life. Would you like to do it at our magazine full time? So I was like, yeah, sure. And that's kind of how you I said got... the magic words. You said yeah, full time. Full full time. So that was around 2011, I want to say 2010. So that's kind of how I got my first full time job. Right. So it wasn't a plan. It's not like you knew that you wanted to write about food or No, it was what was there right. basically. Um cuz when I was in university, food reporting, food writing wasn't really an option that was brought up when it's came to food writing, all we knew about was like restaurant reviews. Review, yeah. And back then, you know, we knew that those jobs are few and far in between and you could, a position opens up when the food critic retires or like dies basically. Yeah. So it was never in my mind. 
So then you found yourself in this career. How did you, like, tell me a little bit about your approach, because it's not reviews, like you're doing reporting, you're often pulling out some really interesting themes, you're highlighting interesting people. Yeah, so Lost Turnbull, the former publisher of the magazine that I We can say the I name too, eh? It's, it's called iWeekly, I, 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 I want to keep it simple. It, it started <laughs> off as iWeekly, but then it got rebranded into a publish, publication called The Grid. Yes. Um, so Lost was in charge of that transition, and he said something that still resonates with, with me in terms of what, what, what the mandate of The Grid was. It was to uh, make people s smarter about their city mm -hmm. um, and to you know, not be snarky, but be smart, because this was during the early uh, 2010s when like Perez Hilton gawker blogger culture was. Snark was everywhere. Yeah. yeah, so he was like, don't be snarky, just be smart. Your job is to make people feel smarter about their city and know yeah. how their city works and why things are the way that they are. So I took that approach with um, food writing and restaurants writing. So, you know, why do op restaurants operate the way that they do? Um, why are dishes plated the way that they are like this? Why does this cost that? Um, what's the process like of a chef creating a dish? Why is a restaurant designed like this? Why is your experience at a typical restaurant like that? So I kind of, because I was also curious about that as well, because I never worked in a restaurant. One of my old editors at Toronto Life was like, you know, if you have those questions, the reader probably does too. Yes. And your job is to answer those questions because if you don't know, the reader doesn't know. And if it interests you, chances are the reader is also interested as well. So I think taking that approach when talking about food really makes the reader feel smarter about why things are the way that they are when they step into the restaurant or when they go to the grocery store. And it's that added layer of knowledge that I think readers want um, from food writing and kind of separates a food article that's like reported and researched from something you can you know find on a Yelp or a Google review. Yeah. Yeah. That's purely experiential and not about context. Yeah, you know, as when you're a reporter, you have access to information that the average person doesn't. You can go into the kitchen, you can ask a chef like all these questions that the average diner can't. So when you're a food reporter, your job is to take advantage of that access and get the information that the average diner wouldn't so that it gives the, the reader a reason to read your stuff rather than yes. just, you know, going online and scrolling through reviews or just... Or Instagram or, 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 like or, or, or TikTok or whatever. Or an Instagram, yeah. I also think, though, that often that illuminates bigger issues. Like you also end up touching on labor issues or identity or even things like supply chain. Like when you're thinking about why something costs the way it does, you're not just explaining the restaurant world, you're also in a larger way explaining the world. So yeah. what to you makes food such an interesting lens of understanding the world? Well, I mean, everyone's interested in food. Everyone eats, everyone goes grocery shopping, even if you don't consider yourself a foodie, like you're still going to the grocery yes. store or like, yeah or you're still going to a restaurant. Like, so it's a perfect entry point into explaining larger issues because food doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right. It's connected to culture, it's connected to history, it's connected to um, labor. Someone has to cook that food, someone has to pick those apples, someone has to harvest those peppers, someone's you know working the cash register when you're cashing out. It's all related, you can't talk about food and shut out the production process, the people behind it. Because once again, I think that my job is, as a food writer is to explain how things are the way that they are. Food doesn't just magically appear on your plate. So I think by giving that context of why the food is the way that it is, or um, why is the food of this culinary region is the way that it is, or why is the food in Toronto different from like another style of cooking somewhere else. Yes. I think that adds that extra context to the readers to make them feel smarter when they're out shopping or yeah. out eating. Yeah. Or even just to understand, like I remember first reading about how immigra immigration patterns shaped um, the types of Indian cuisine that became popular in North America or the type of Chinese cuisine or the type of Thai cuisine mm -hmm. and being like a little bit shook to understand that this big geopolitical issue has such an impact on the way that 
like what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. Yeah. Like that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Like changes in migration patterns caused by, you know, war, famine, yeah. um, political strife. A lot of that shapes how cuisines are the way that they are or what types of ethnic enclaves and populations land in a city like Toronto. And that in turn shapes what kind of food we're eating. Yeah. yeah. I remember reading like really interesting conversations about what we will pay for certain types of foods and why some foods are perceived as like fancy and some are not. Or reading about, if you ever read, I don't remember if it was in the Toronto Life Archives or if it was just like later, mm. but I remember reading about what Thai food was like in like the early 90s and how much ketchup there was in Thai food and being horrified. But also that's so interesting because it gives you such a look into what the demographics of the city were like and what our sort of social understanding of, of food was. Yeah, it gives you like a snapshot of what taste buds were like back then and who were the predominant customers and yes. who were the taste makers that dictated which foods gets elevated into fancy status or which cuisines had to be relegated to cheap and cheerful and which were the cuisines that were elevated, who were the chefs that were getting the media spotlight and just how food was written, you yeah. know, which food gets deemed as comfort food and which food gets deemed as exotic and, and new and strange. Yeah. So, you know, looking back at older food articles, even from five or 10 years ago, you know, you, it, it, it sometimes it seems like a completely different world. world. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you can kind of see how things have progressed in terms of readers being a little bit more aware of culinary regions or, you know, using better terminology. Yes. You know, you can say bao now. And people will understand what and that means. And people will understand what that means. And you don't have to say like a steamed Chinese bun or something yes. like that. Yeah, that's such a good point. The I think I'm always, because I came up at a time where most of my editors were right, were white and I was, I think we always thought that we were predominantly speaking to white audiences. So I still am retraining myself to be like, you don't have to explain every cultural reference. You don't have to include the parenthetical like, this is what this is. This is who this person is. This is, you know, like that explanation. You don't have to do that. Yeah. So at the Toronto Star, my current place of employment, my editor is um, South Asian. Right. And, uh, she, and she's from Scarborough. And it's really great to work under someone like her because you know she's like she's like you she's she's like you don't have to explain this thing people know what it is or like um i she's like i, I wouldn't use the word exotic <laughs> to describe anything i would avoid that term yeah. just entirely please. like it's you know I, I i absolutely love working with 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 priya she's like yeah. she's one of the best editors i've ever had which is so exciting to have that institutional buy-in too right that because sometimes I might be doing that, like I might have that impulse to do it, and you need someone who has maybe a bit more power than you to say, it's actually okay. Yeah, and, and I think because with food writing, a lot of my predecessors, you know, weren't Chinese or East, yes. East Asian. So what was odd or foreign or, or new to them might be comfort food for me, but because it's so ingrained and there's no really no template on food writing, Sometimes yes. um, subconsciously I absorb those things and, you know, a dish that, you know, I might have been eating when I was growing up, I might felt compelled to try to explain it or try to exoticize it uh, to an audience. Because yes. that's just what I learned growing up. So sometimes yeah. you kind of have to catch yourself or thankfully in my case, I have a really fantastic team of editors who are like, it's take, okay. take this out. <laughs> Talk to me about the current state of food writing in Canada, because I feel like there's you, there's maybe a few other people, but I see really interesting conversations happening around veganism, around ethnic food, around the ethics of food production, but I don't always know that they're happening in kind of mainstream publications. Yeah, I mean, that's always the struggle I find in terms of the Canadian food scene and that there's no dearth of talent and interesting foods going on just in Toronto alone. Like I are, it's, I would say not one of, I think it's the most diverse um, culinary scene in the world, if you think of a regional cuisine, chances are there's someone here that is does it, it extremely well. Yeah. The sad thing is, I don't think that there are enough publications out there or enough um, full-time staff writers who are able to cover all that. And with food, it's such a wide-ranging topic that there's no way that one or two 
people can cover it all and have that knowledge base no. to do it justice. And tell me a little bit too about what does it mean to cover something from a staff position, like to have a staff position devoted to this versus trying to be a freelance food writer? Like what are the different challenges and opportunities there? Staff, of course, like having job security so. um, is always, it's, it's a huge, huge burden off uh, your shoulders. I mean, as secure as one can be in the in media industry. Yeah. I, I did freelance for a little bit um, after I got um, laid off from the grid. And it was very difficult because every time you pitch an idea, it has to be like the best idea that you've ever had to impress a publication or, or, or an editor. Well, I think that's how we met. We met, I'm pretty sure, when I was at House and Home and I assigned you something, but then it, it's not just like it has to be the best idea. It also has to like, you have to understand so many publications and what their little quirks are and what they want. And like, obviously the house and home approach to food is not gonna be the Toronto Star approach to food. It has to be a very well-researched pitch. Yes. You have to be, be extremely on your A-game. You always have to be on your A-game, but I think for freelancers, like the pressure is on a lot more. As a staffer, I think like I, I have the luxury of having a little bit more time to develop yes. a, a story and to figure out how the structure is going to be, um, yeah. Do you feel, because I think sometimes from a freelance perspective, it almost feels a little bit more about like the marketplace of ideas and so you want to give people the things that will perform and you want to like hit it out of the park every time. Whereas when I've been on staff, I feel like I can maybe experiment a little bit more. Is that something that you feel like? I think so, because I think as a staffer, um, you have a better understanding of what your editor wants yeah. and also you know, what worked and, and what did it in the past. You have that track record where um, an editor can say like, okay, this article did, did really well. We got really good um, responses or like, oh, this didn't perform well at all, like no one was interested in it. So you, I think yeah. so, you know, when you have that info, you can kind of be like, okay, I think like um, a story like this would do well, or like, oh, you know what? Like, I don't think we've ever covered this before. So let's, let's try and that. Institutional knowledge. Yeah, well. you have a little bit of institutional knowledge, but as a freelancer, you have to do a lot more legwork to, you know, make sure that one, this topic hasn't been written about before from that publication, but you also don't really have those, um, that inside knowledge of like whether a subject like that did well yes. or not. So, you know, is you, you did all this research on this topic, you're, you're getting your, your, your contacts um, in a row, you did all this pre-research, but you also don't know if a story like this would do well. Yeah. Or, or did well for that publication. So you're spending all this time and then, but you have no idea if the editor knows, like if it would um, do well. Yeah, and even I think there's like the, will it perform from a metrics perspective, but also like, what are the publication's other goals? What are the other like things that go into the decision to assign a story? You don't know. Yeah, you're you have not no idea. Meetings. You're not in those meetings. So you don't know if it's like, listen, actually our readership, like we've noticed a huge growth among this particular demographic and we want to make sure to serve their, like, you don't know, you have yeah. no idea. The other thing that you mentioned when we were like talking about this before was that you're one of the few full-time reporters with a salary unionized job. Yeah. What's the responsibilities that come with that type of security? I would say definitely because, you know, I am in like a, unfortunately pr considered privileged position. Wild to think, but here we are. Now, so I, I think that because, you know, I am in like, again, as comfortable as one yes. could be and knowing that a lot of up and coming food writers might not have the opportunities that I do, you know, so any time, I, I think my responsibility is to try to help them as much as I can, whether it's even just like sitting with them for like, half an hour on like a Zoom session to just yeah. tell them everything that I know of what I think is good food writing or to t tell them how I got my job. Like I, I, I think it's just as much as I can to kind of give them the, 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 the leg up, I guess, or try to level the playing field for them as much as possible. Because I think if you're trying to start out now as opposed to 15 years ago, it's a different world. It's much, much more different. And I, th 
I think that you could easily get into thinking that like, I gotta like white knuckle onto my job. I don't want anyone else coming for it. I gotta like elbow everyone yes. else away. This is my turf. Like there's only one job, it's all mine. But for me, I'm like, no, more food, food writers is a fantastic thing. Having more people cover it would convince publications that like, oh, there's so many people writing about these things. And people are interested. And people are interested. It's doing well. You know, there's communities that haven't been covered yet. And there's all these writers that have that insider knowledge that either speak the language or come from that background. They're telling these stories that we weren't able to tell. So we should invest more in it. We should um, hire more uh, food writers from all these different backgrounds so that they could tell stories from their unique point of view and have that knowledge. And, oh yeah, okay, maybe we should increase the budget for food writing or for freelance food writing. Or like, oh, or, or maybe we have, we can even start like just an entire new um, publication de devoted to food. So, and, and because of that, that also makes my job a little bit more secure. Cause yeah, if food writing's doing really well in the country, then the star would be like, yeah, then we got to hold on to this guy. Yeah, because we have someone who's doing this right here already, who knows our brand and... Yeah, so, you know, part of it is, you, you know, trying to make the world a better place by having food writers. But, like, there's also a selfish component to it in that if everyone does well, I also do well. I mean, I think, though, that's such an interesting point to make as well because I've been thinking a lot about, like, scarcity mindset versus abundance mindset and how do you actually... How do you actually believe that everything is abundant when there actually are real barriers? There's real barriers that we face as people of color. There's real barriers that we face regard, like belonging to multiple marginalized groups. There's barriers, just economic barriers in place. But the point that you're making of like this idea of solidarity between us and the, the more of us who are doing well, the more I will do well as well. Yeah. That was very repetitive, but like that idea is actually very powerful and true. Yeah, like any, the, the funny thing is that at the start, anytime a colleague you know, has a food story, they're always like, they're, 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 yeah, they're always, they're always so nice about it. Whether it's a veteran reporter or whether it's um, an intern, they're like, you know, I have this, this food thing that I'm kind of interested in, but I don't want to step on your toes. I'm like, like, please, right? I'm always like, please, please, please right about the more food, the better, like yeah. more food in the paper is always a fantastic thing. And, and, and I, I do see that, that, a, that a lot. I'm always like, okay, please go for it. Let me know if, if, you, if I can help in, in yeah. any, any way. I, I always encourage like everyone at the paper to write about food. And, and anytime they do, I'm always like, ah, that's so cool. Well, also because you, you actually, there are only so many hours in a day, like you cannot cover every story. Yeah. And you're not the right person to cover every story. Yeah, there are some, you know, aspects of food that I'm not as well versed in right. or either don't have the contacts or have that cultural knowledge or have that firsthand experience growing up. So, you know, there's a lot of food stories, but I think part of also being a good food writer is knowing when to step back and being like, okay, this is a great story, but I'm not the one to tell it. Right. But you are, you have, I think your experience your knowledge would do this story justice. And it's that scarcity mindset. If you want to be a food writer, you want the best stories to be out there. Yeah. And I think being a good food writer also is knowing your limits. And for the sake of the story or for the sake of the subjects, sometimes you have to go, okay, you know what? It's a great story. I'm not the best person to write about it. Let me try to find someone who will do it justice. Let me guess, yeah. yeah. What are the food stories in general that you are most excited about reading? Which are the ones that you're kind of bored of? Like there are some food writing tropes. And so I'm very interested from like your insider perspective. Is there a food story that you just never want to read again? Um, I mean, there are some cliches that I think that we've kind of moved past, you know, like the, the immigrant lunchbox story of, you know. My smelly lunch? My, my, smelly, my smelly lunch. Because I think if that story gets told over and over again, then or like if that's the predominant story that takes up most of the space, then it means that other stories can't be, be told. Um, and it's also not everyone's story. Not everyone has that experience. So for myself, my high school was predominantly um, Chinese um, right. in the early 2000s. So you know, people brought in like preserved um, sausage, like yeah. rice, and like all these like herbal soups, and like no one cared. 
um, even the people who weren't Chinese. Like, yeah. so it didn't resonate as much as me. And like, and I actually asked Lainey, Lainey, Elaine Liu ab about it once. And I was like, oh, did you ever have your lunchbox moment? And she was like, no. She was like, no, because the food that my parents made was delicious. I never, first of all, she was like, yes. so, you know, I wasn't embarrassed about it because I had no reason to be embarrassed by it. So I think that really, I think that was a really um, light bulb moment where, right. you know, at that time I thought everyone had it or I kind of convinced myself that I must have had one too because I kept reading it everywhere. But yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Um, she kind of came in and was like, no. <laughs> But it's fun. So I definitely had not that moment. I just didn't want to take any of those things. I grew up in a really white suburb. So I was requesting Lunchables and peanut butter and jelly. And my mom was like, OK, whatever, like whatever, just eat your lunch. I think what you're describing, too, is like how we kind of center whiteness in our storytelling mm -hmm. or how whiteness as a social construct shapes what kind of stories get told. Because many, many people did not grow up in white suburbs or just didn't care or whatever. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that it also kind of does a disservice if you kind of distill entire ethnic groups into like My one, food is one, one food yeah. moment and at the risk of not telling other stories. Yes. Yes. So I think we're starting to move out of that. And I think a large part of that is that um, we're seeing a lot more diverse food writers pop up who have a lot more different experiences and are kind of breaking out of the I got to write for this specific audience, audience. And, yeah. um, and realizing that readers are extremely diverse, know a lot about food, um, especially nowadays, and don't want that same narrative repeated. Because if you repeat it, it can turn from going from a cliche to actually being harmful and reductive. Yeah, yeah, totally. Is there anything I didn't ask you about food writing or about your career that you wanted to talk about? No, I just want to say, like, Toronto is just an exciting, such an exciting city always for food. Not just because almost every culinary region is represented, but we're also seeing a lot of what I like to call third culture cooking. And that's taking the food from, you know, your parents or grandparents, whatever heritage, and incorporating that with the culture that you grew up in in, right. in Toronto and taking what's natural to you, what you grew up eating in Toronto, and mixing it with what your family ate. And I think it's different from what's perceived as like fusion cooking. I think fusion cooking is perceived as just taking, mashing up two, two different cultures for the sake of creating a novelty and mashing up different cultures. But third culture cooking, I think it's a very natural extension of first and second generation kids who grew up in different cultures at home and at school or at work. And it just comes natural to them to combine these different flavors and ingredients from different cultures because that's just what they knew. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of that with a lot of the younger 20-something, 30-something chefs who you know came here as a kid. At home, they ate wontons, but at school, they ate beef patties. Right. And, you know, how do we bring those 20 years together? later they're like let's bring those flavors together why not that yeah. seems like it, it makes perfect sense to me yeah yeah um, and also for me as someone who loves food is there anything that you wanted to promote or plug or that's coming up for you that uh, you want to just talk about? please subscribe to the to the star <laughs> not if, if not for the food um, the for uh, any of the other reporting we like like the the investigative team sports um, business like the online breaking team, like they're all working overtime. The City Hall um, yes. reporters as well. Yes, especially city, right now. Our City Hall and Queen's Park Bureau, I don't know how they do it. Like they're, they're just there around the clock. Yeah, breaking so, incredibly important. Subscribe course. to the Star. Um, and also um, you can access the Star for free through the Toronto Public Library. I love that you said that. From an equity perspective, you have no excuse not to be reading. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. I'm so glad you were able to come through. All right. Thank you, Stacey. Good. Biggest misconceptions people have about working in food media is that we're all restaurant critics or that we eat five, six times, five, six giant meals a day, or that we come into a restaurant, like make a big announcement that like, we're here, I'm here, I'm 
I'm influential. I can make or break your restaurant. Um, it's not the case for me anyways. <laughs> um, 